Genesis 46, 47, and 9. Psalm 119, 68 states a very wonderful truth in a very few words. It says, uh, and the psalmist is praying to God, and he says this, you are good and do good. <clears throat> very simple. The psalmist says to God, you are good and you do good. <clears throat> the Lord's essential nature is one of goodness. That's, what he, that's, that's, what, that's who he is. He's good. And out of that goodness flow good actions. You can see that throughout all of the scripture. Genesis 47 and the previous the verses previous to that are no exception. Uh, God is good to his people. He blesses us even though we've done, we do nothing worthy of blessing. Nevertheless, he blesses us. Now, if you remember from Genesis 45 last week that Joseph has commanded his father, not only invited him, he in fact commanded him to come uh, to live, leave Canaan and come live in Egypt. He did that out of a heart full of love and concern for his family. The uh, famine is in full force. Uh, people are hungry. And Joseph says in Genesis 45, to his, his, through his brothers, to his father, you're going to be impoverished. If you don't come down to Egypt, you're going to be poverty stricken. I don't want that to happen. I want you to come to Egypt. I'm going to provide for you. By the way, God's goodness is seen how? Through God's people so often as it is through Joseph here. Pharaoh confirms that, decision, that, confirms that decision to travel down to Egypt. God finalizes it in Genesis 46.3 when he says to Jacob, he says, uh, don't be afraid to come down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. So we find out, again, this is not just about a lack of food. There's a greater plan in mind that God has. God wants to form a nation within the confines of, of Egypt. This is a multi-layered plan that God has in mind. This is typical of the Lord having far more in mind than we can ever imagine. We see what a, a little portion of it. He's got a greater plan, a long-range plan, an eternal plan. So Jacob and his brother, his family rather, leave Canaan. They travel down to Egypt. They head south to Egypt. And last week we talked about <clears throat> the list, Genesis 46, verses 8 to 27. You see all those names there. You know how we don't like to see names, a bunch of names in the Bible. All those names are necessary. Those are all the people that make the trip with the exception of a few, 70 in all. Some are already in Egypt, but they're included as well. But the question I want to answer tonight is this. How does God demonstrate his goodness to Israel in these events? How does our good God demonstrate his goodness to Israel, to Jacob's family, in the events that are to follow? Well, first of all, there's several, several ways. But first of all, in bringing about a happy reunion. In bringing about a happy reunion, look at chapter 46, verse 28. Now Jacob sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out all the way before him to Goshen, and they came to the, to the land of Goshen. Jacob prepared his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Isaac. As soon as he appeared before him, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a long time. Then Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face, that you are still alive. Now if you read from verses 29 of chapter 46, all the way through chapter 47, the entire chapter. The main character, the prominent character that's going to stand out is, is Joseph, without a doubt. However, verse 28 of chapter 46, the main character is Judah. Judah, Jacob, will send Judah ahead of him to Egypt. Uh, Judah, Jacob will send Judah to be the guide to the region of Egypt called Goshen. Judah is sent ahead to point the way. Some probably means that he's sent ahead to uh, notify Joseph that he's on the way to Goshen. And so because, I say that because in verse 29, what does Joseph do? He, he prepares, he harnesses, literally, he harnesses his chariot to get it ready to go. He rides to Goshen to meet the family. Somehow he must have been notified, which no doubt was done by Judah. Now that verse, verse 28, as you look at it, now he sent Judah before him to point out the way to Goshen. That seems very tri trivial in and of itself. But it's another indication that, of the renewed trust that Jacob has in his son, Judah. Remember, it was Judah who, in chapter 43, said, I'll, on the second trip to Egypt, let me take Benjamin. They, you know, Joseph said, bring your brother Benjamin down here or I'm not going to give you any food. He said, let me take Benjamin down with me to Egypt. I'll be responsible for him. And, uh, and he said that. And then it was Judah who stuck his neck out and gave the great impassioned speech and said, I'll, because Joseph wanted to put Benjamin and uh, make him a slave, he said, I'll, I'll, I'll take his place. I'll be a slave. And so he made sure, Judah made sure he returned Benjamin to his father. Now, there's some indication in Genesis 42, I talked about this already, verse 36, that Jacob did not trust any of his sons. 
minus Joseph and Benjamin, and that includes Judah. He didn't necessarily trust Judah, but now he puts him in charge of this road trip to Egypt. How ironic this is, since it was Judah who in chapter 37 told, you remember this in chapter 37? He, he was the one who suggested to his brothers, hey, let's sell Joseph as a slave into Egypt. That suggestion led to the separation of Joseph from his father. For how long? For 22 years. That suggestion. Let's do this. And they did it. And now the guy who, the one who engineered this disunion of Joseph and his father is now leading the way to their reunion. Amazing. Goes to show you that a that, that person, though he was a great sinner in the past, we've talked about this before with Judah, though he was a miserable failure in the past, God can save people like that. God can restore people like that, once again, to the place of usefulness. Once again, I want to tell you that, as we've said about Judah before, God can transform the useless into the useful. He can transform the profitless into the profitable. He makes people fit for the kingdom of heaven. Who does this? God makes people fit. He makes people qualified, the New Testament says, for the kingdom of heaven. Now, when Joseph finds out his father's on his way, look at verse 29. He harnesses his chariot. It doesn't say this, but I'm pretty sure. I, I have this impression. He drives like Jehu in the Old Testament. Remember Jehu in the Old Testament, 2 Kings 9 to 11? How did Jehu drive his chariot in the Old Testament? Furiously. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure, although I can't prove it, that Joseph is so ex clearly very excited to see his father, you can see this by his reaction, that uh, he's probably driving like a madman to get to go. Oh, he's going to Goshen. That's where I told him to go, Goshen. <laughs> and uh, verse 29 describes the happy reunion. Uh, verse 29 of, of chapter 46 uh, says that uh, as soon as he appeared before him, he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a long time. Lots of hugging, lots of weeping. By the way, I think this is about the fifth time that Joseph is weeping, fourth or fifth time. He's weeping in regard to his family. That's again and again and again. He does. It just shows the, the brokenness he feels over the suffering of missing them for 22 years, of the joy he now feels of meeting him. Amazing. As to Jacob, for Jacob's reaction, verse 30, look what he says. Once he sees his son, now let me die. <laughs> well, you don't want to die right now, Jacob. Since I have seen your face that you are still alive, he thought he would never see him again. 22 years. He thought, why would he think he'd ever see him again? And yet now he sees him, no doubt overflowing with joy at this happy reunion. This is beyond his wildest dreams. And he, so he says, now let me die. So I've seen, since I've seen your face, my last uh, thing on my bucket list is crossed. This is it. This is the big one. I'm okay now. I can die in peace. And you, when you see that, when you see that reaction there, it's, it, it, you know, it's a similar reaction to somebody in the New Testament by the name of Simeon. Over in Luke chapter 2, Simeon uh, gets to hold the baby Jesus. That's, a, that's an amazing privilege in itself. Can you imagine that? And in Luke 2, 28 and following, he just, Simeon describes, it describes this joyful scene. It says, then Simeon took the baby Jesus into his arms and blessed God. And he said, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation. So I'm, Simeon said, I can die with great satisfaction now. Now I've seen that God has sent someone, a Messiah, to save his people. I can rejoice in this. I've seen with my own two eyes. And Jacob, who is preoccupied with death, says, now I can go to death in peace. I can go to the grave in peace. God's been good to me in allowing me to see my son again. But there's a second, uh, there's a second way here that God shows his goodness, and that is in settling the family in the best location. In settling the family in the best location, look at chapter 46, verse 31. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their heads uh, and their herds and all they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth, even until now. Both we and our fathers, that you may live in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians. Now, this too may seem trivial. As you read this, you say, ah, so what's the big deal about this? Occupations, and they're living in this place called Goshen. Who cares about any of this? Uh, and when, when Pharaoh told, you remember back in chapter 45, when Pharaoh said, uh, 
look, I want you to bring your family down here, Jacob. I want them to live in what? The best of the land. Actually, the word is good, but it's talking about the best of the land. Well, it turns out that the best of the land for Jacob's family is Goshen. The reason for that is because this is an area good for livestock. In fact, one commentator says this, the land of Goshen was located in the northeast part of the Nile Delta. By the way, my high-tech map I drew for, uh, that is, I didn't draw, draw it, but I have there. I actually, I did something on the map. I circled the word Goshen. It's very high-tech of me to do that. You can see where it is. Sometimes maps are helpful, sometimes they're not. You look at it, well, I don't even know where this is anyway, somewhere in the world. It's uh, Egypt, is next to Israel. The land of Goshen was located in the northeast part of the Nile Delta, an area of about 900 square miles. Here's the thing, very fertile and excellent for grazing cattle. This is perfect. Jacob's brothers are shepherds. They're also called keepers of livestock here. By the way, these are interchangeable terms, shepherds, keepers of livestock. You might think in this section here, Jacob is trying to trick Pharaoh somehow. He's not doing that. He's simply telling his brothers to tell Pharaoh honestly, look, when he says, you know, J Jacob, Joseph knows Pharaoh. He knows what he's going to ask. When he says, what is your occupation? How does he know that? He knows Pharaoh, that's why. When he says, what's your occupation? I want you to just be honest with them and tell them what you do for a living. And that's the truth. Jacob's family has always been an animal husbandry. That's what they've always done. Flocks, herds, sheep, cattle, so on. Tell them the truth. Well, why is he making such a big deal out of their occupation? Look at verse 34. Because that you may live in the land of Goshen. You're to do this. Tell them this. Your shepherds, your keepers of livestock. Uh, why? Because that you may, so that you may live in the land of Goshen. Goshen, you see, is the place for keepers of livestock. For shepherds, it's a match made in heaven. I would, actually, it's a match made from heaven. God is doing this. You, you can see how Joseph, how wise Joseph is in selecting Goshen as a place for his family to live, and how ultimately how wise God is in selecting Goshen. And Joseph knows. He knows this about Pharaoh. He knows a lot about Pharaoh, and he's a wise person. He knows if Pharaoh understands their family business, he'll have no problem saying. Yep, let them live in Goshen. Why? Look at verse 34 in the end of it. Because every shepherd, everyone involved in livestock, is loathsome to the Egyptians. Loathsome. Shepherds, according to this verse, now secular history doesn't talk about, the, the commentators make a big deal, oh, secular history doesn't mention this at all. Well, the Bible mentions it, and that's all we need to know, but that's the truth. Shepherds, according to this verse, at least at that time in Egyptian history, were considered loathsome. To the Egyptians, or you could substitute the, word, substitute the word abomination. They were considered an abomination, literally, to the Egyptians. They were considered abhorrent to the Egyptians. Let me ask you this question in light of all this. Is it a bad thing that the shepherds are loathsome, considered loathsome to the Egyptians at this time? Because it sounds like it may hurt their cause for living in Egypt. Oh, shepherds, we don't like shepherds. What are you guys doing here in Egypt? Uh, but this is actually a blessing in disguise. You see, Goshen is, in the, is on the out, located on the outer edges of Egypt. Uh, on, it's on the border of Canaan. It's away from the mainstream. And Joseph knew that once his brothers told Pharaoh what they did for a living, he wouldn't argue with this. Come on, they can live out in the boondocks. Good. <laughs> you see, the Egyptians, they want to live segregated lives from the Hebrew foreign shepherds. That's just fine with them. I don't need those smelly lowly shepherds around. Let them live out there, far away from us. We don't need that. And so they're more than happy to say yes to this. And the fact that sh there are shepherds also means we have no ambitions in the land of Egypt. Joseph is the prime minister. Maybe these guys want to get in on that. Uh, maybe he, jo they, they think Joseph can get gets to pull in the government. But they have no ambitions outside of shepherding to live in Egypt. They have no political ambitions at all. And furthermore, they're not going to be an economic burden on Egypt, because except for the food they're going to get. However, they're bringing their own cattle in. They're bringing their own livestock in. Pharaoh doesn't have to worry about any of that. There could be another reason. Living in Goshen is going to be away from the mainstream of, of the population, the mainstream population of the Egyptians, which will help to keep them away from idolatry. It's a big thing. Very wise decision on Joseph's part which is why he insists that Goshen, he's been insisting from chapter 45, Goshen's where you need to go. That's where you need to go. 
for several reasons. Now, this decision to live in Goshen even plays a part in the book of Exodus as you go forward in Exodus. Remember the plagues that God sends in Exodus? Well, when he does that, guess what it generally does not affect when he sends the plagues in Egypt? It doesn't affect the land of Goshen, where his people live. For example, take the plague of flies in Exodus chapter 8. God promised to plague Egypt with flies, but not Israel. In fact, you'll see more, more than one reference to this. Exodus 8.22 says, in that day, the Lord says, I will set apart what? I'll set apart the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no flies shall be there. Well, that's a big deal. It's becoming more important. In order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land, I will make a difference between my people, Israel, and your people, the Egyptians. Very important that they're going to be in Goshen. They're going to escape, escape all this... Um, incredible plagues. And so Joseph and Joseph's God knew what they were doing in advance when they selected Goshen as their residence of choice in Egypt. Now you talk about long-range planning. <laughs> this is pretty amazing. When you, by the way, when you're making a decision, or you're getting ready to take an action, whatever it is, it honestly doesn't matter what it is, you better think about the long-term consequences of your choice. You can make a decision in the short term, that can eliminate an immediate problem, but you may pay the price in the long term if you don't think about the long-term consequences, especially as it relates to the Lord and his plans. Look at chapter 47, verse 1. Joseph went in and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers and their flocks and their herds and all they have have come out of the land of Canaan, and behold, they're in the land of Goshen. You see the word Goshen again and again and again in this section. He took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, oh, what is your occupation? That's what he told us he was going to say. So they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. They said to Pharaoh, we have come to sojourn in the land, for there's no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants live in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come, have come to you. He's always dealing with Joseph when he gets to the final word in. Verse 6, the land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. In this case, let them live in the land of Goshen. And if you know of any capable men among them, then put them in charge of my, life, my livestock. Now, first of all, why does Joseph select only five of his 11 brothers to come with him? <laughs> well, you got to, my guess is that, first of all, it would be cumbersome to have 11 brothers standing in front of Pharaoh. Uh, that's for one thing. But I think uh, he probably eliminated certain brother, brethren, certain brethren, who may have not been uh, kosher. <laughs> kosher, I wouldn't mean to say that word. <laughs> who may have made matters worse before Pharaoh, who may have put their foot in their mouth. <laughs> Joseph, being the wise man that he is, says, I think I'll leave those other six guys over there. I'll take this five, these five guys right here, representatives of the group. And he takes these guys with him. And Pharaoh not only grants their request to live in Canaan, but he also asks Joseph, hey, you got any capable men, any competent men among you, any men who are able to, sh to supervise the royal livestock? I mean, this is going to be a, a big job among you. How about your brothers? Any of them wise enough, managerial enough, smart enough uh, to do this? Remember back in Genesis 41, 39, when Pharaoh described Joseph? He said, there's no one so discerning as wise as you are. You're the wisest person in even all of Egypt. They were probably figures, well, if Joseph is wise, maybe his brothers are wise too. I mean, that would be logical. Um, but there's no record of Joseph's brothers ever, you know, supervising the royal livestock. It could be, by the way, wisdom doesn't necessarily run in a family. Uh, wisdom is given to those who... First of all, who seek God, who seek his word, who ask for his wisdom. And, uh, and there's no record of this happening at all. But what is important is that God's wisdom and God's goodness is, is, it even shows itself down to the very residence that God chooses for his people to live in Egypt. But thirdly, God's goodness is demonstrated in granting an eternal residence. God's goodness, is granted, uh, God's goodness is demonstrated in granting an eternal residence. Look at chapter 47, verse 7. 
Then Joseph brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. This is a moment in history, by the way, this meeting. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many years have you lived? So Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my sojourning are 130. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my fathers lived among, uh, during the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. Now, what are the chances that a, a shepherd like Jacob, uh, a man whose occupation has been an animal husbandry, would ever expect to have a personal introduction to the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh? What are the chances of that? On the human level, slim and none. In fact, in reality, they're none. Not at all. And yet, here is Joseph presenting his father to Pharaoh. Obviously, this is of God. Now, the Egyptians, think about this. We've just read this. They consider shepherds to be what? Loathsome people. People who are, are abominable. But the Pharaoh of Egypt has now met five of these abominable characters, five brothers of Joseph. He's met, meeting another loathsome character in the person of Jacob. They're all shepherds, right? But the reception given by Pharaoh is one of politeness, one of goodwill, kindness. Only the Lord could have made this arrangement possible. This is so unusual a patriarch and a pharaoh, face-to-face. -face. The conversation between these men is very brief, but also very enlightening. It contains great spiritual truth, yet it's tempered at the same time by a negative attitude on Jacob's part, somewhat negative attitude at least. So let's, let's look at the negatives and the positives in this, in this conversation. First of all, the negatives. Notice Pharaoh has only one thing to say in this conversation. It's a question, a very simple question. How many years have you lived? That's all he says. Obviously, uh, since Jacob has all these sons, he's got all these grandchildren, likely the appearance of old age is the logical question to ask. <clears throat> Plus, in the ancient Near East, they valued longevity. They had great respect for older people. Pharaoh showing respect for Jacob by even asking the question. Now, Pharaoh is superior to Jacob in position. He's the, he's the king. But Jacob is superior to Pharaoh in age, also in spirituality, I might say. Uh, he knows God. Uh, Pharaoh doesn't. But it's a simple question of respect that deserves a simple answer. So what's his answer? Well, he could simply say, I'm 130 years old. Your, uh, your highness, your kingship, it's a great honor to meet you. I'm 130 years old. That's not how he answers. Look at verse 9. <laughs> Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my sojourning are 130 Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my fathers lived during the days of their sojourning. That's more information Pharaoh is looking for. He does say I'm 130 years old, but then he adds two bits, other bits of information. He says, look, he says, few and unpleasant have been the years of my life. <laughs> you ever talk to somebody and you ask them the question, how are you doing? And they, they, instead of saying I'm okay, I'm fine, all is good, all is well, you get a, a short history of their miserable life. You know, I've got some aches and pains to deal with. My arthritis is flaring up again. And you kind of think, well, I wish I wouldn't even said anything at all. <laughs> Jacob really should consider who he's talking to here. <clears throat> this is the Pharaoh of Egypt. <clears throat> he's got government business to take care of. He doesn't have time for life history right now. But let's think through Jacob's reply. He says, I've lived a few years. Now, that's especially in relationship to his ancestors, Abraham and Isaac, his grandfather and father. His grandfather, Abraham, lived to be 175 years of age. His father died at 180 years of age. That is serious, some serious longevity. By the way, Jacob's going to die at 147 years of age, but he's 130 right now. Uh, but 130 is not exactly a short lifespan, even back then. In fact, Egyptian literature said this, they, they, they considered the ideal lifespan, a lifespan to be 110 years. And here, in thinking this, here's Jacob saying, well, you know, I haven't lived very long. And I think, oh, wait, that's about 20 years. That's about two decades longer than we would actually hope to live. Is 130 years a short life? Well, not in the way that we humans reckon time on earth. It's a long life, even at that time. But Joseph, Jacob views himself in, this, in, in light of his father. Notice this. He views himself in the light of his father and his grandfather. It seems like he lives in their shadow. And I, I'm pretty sure he did live in their shadow. These are considered great men, uh, men that God has called 
although I'm not impressed with Isaac personally, but he's living in their shadow. It's hard to live in the shadow of great people. It really is. Uh, if your father and grand, you know, there's people that are uh, pastors or theologians, great pastors, and they had their son was a pastor and their grandson was a pastor and their great grandson was a pastor, and so you're thinking, oh, gee, my dad was a great pastor, so now I got to be a great pastor. And so you're thinking that. But, you know, we must also understand this, that great people put on their pants one leg at a time, just like we do. They have to deal with their sins just like we do. They need a savor just like we do. And while people who walk with God can stir us to a deeper spiritual level of commitment, nevertheless, we should not compare ourselves with other people. We're, our standard is what? It's Christ. Now, these people are great, and they're helpful in examples, and I understand all that. Tremendous things that they can, we can be taught, but... Nevertheless, we look to Christ, ultimately. But then he says this, that his life has been unpleasant. Now, the word unpleasant is literally, the, the literal meaning is evil, actually. He's literally saying, few and evil have been the days of my life. In the context here, it means something like unpleasant, or unhappy, or wretched. In fact, one uh, major Hebrew dictionary defines it this way. Uh, it defines the word as poor, not beneficial. Now think about this. Jacob is telling Pharaoh, my life has been unpleasant. It's not really been a beneficial life. In fact, I've had more unhappiness than happiness. Now on the one, on the one hand, there's a lot of truth to that statement. I mean, his life was marked by unhappiness. We know that. Think about it. Jacob's brother Esau had threatened to assassinate him. Not a great moment in your life. His father-in-law Laban had deceived him on many occasions. His daughter had been raped. Rachel, his favorite wife, had died. His sons had committed evil acts that had made his life miserable. He thought Joseph was dead for 22 years. That makes for an unpleasant life. I get that. I recognize the sorrow of Jacob's life. I truly do. I understand it. I see it. I sympathize with him. And I thought of Job 14.1, which says, man born of woman is what? He's a few days and full of trouble. That's true. So while Joe, Jacob did live a long life by human standards, a century and a third, it's a long life, in the light of eternity, our lives are short, actually. Even if we live to be a thousand, we would have to regard our days as few in light of eternity. And life is full of problems. Problems come to each one of us in all shapes and sizes, some more, some less, depending on the person. No one's exempt. But here's the thing, since these things are true, both these things, life is brief, Life is difficult. We had better get our spiritual priorities in order and, and, and so that we might seek to honor God through our difficulties. That's what we have to do, seek to honor God through our difficulties. We must do like Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, doing what? Making the most, redeeming the time, or making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. That's what we're here for. Yes, there are, unple there are unpleasantries in life. There are. The days are evil. Jacob knows it. We know that life can be very unpleasant. And for people in Ukraine right now, I'm sure it's very unpleasant. But Jacob also must realize that some of those unpleasantries were brought on by himself. He's at fault. For example, he deceived his father and brother. That set off a chain of reactions, negative events. He had children from four different women, which caused rivalries. And, this, and the division. He played favorites among his children, which caused jealousy and hatred. These things are all true. And if we are not careful, we, we can make life uh, very unpleasant for ourselves and for others by our actions. We're able to do that. Some of the unpleasantries of Jacob's life were brought on by other people. It wasn't all his fault. The great sorrows of life that come to us through others uh, through no fault of our own, can be heavy burdens to bear. I understand that. But if I'm the one, if I'm the one bringing misery, bringing sorrow, causing sorrow to, to myself, to my family, I have to acknowledge that. But I have to wonder, as I read these words, is this the best way to respond to Pharaoh who's an unbeliever? Is it wise to tell him that your life has not been beneficial, it's been unpleasant, it's been miserable? Now, some would say, well, he's honest. Yes, he is. Honesty is a good thing uh, before a lost world. It can be a good thing, but be careful that your honesty doesn't turn into a session of unedifying conversation. 
starts going south and keeps going south, you're going nowhere with, with that, with that person, with your testimony. Because believers know God, and therefore we have a different outlook on life. We see things from a different point of view. The statement by Jacob here takes me back to Genesis 42, 36. Remember when he, say, he, described, he summarized his life and he said, all these things are what? They're against me. In other words, life is against me. That's what he said. That thought apparently continued to stay with him. Even to this, to this uh, meeting, this encounter with Pharaoh, this is how Jacob tends to view life. Oh, he knows God. And he knows that he knows God. And he knows that God is with him. He knows all these things. But at times, his words seem to betray his trust in God. And I have to, I have to wonder why Jacob, this is the only opportunity. Think about this. This is probably the only opportunity he's going to get to talk to Pharaoh in his entire life, which he would never thought he'd talk to him anyway, with this golden opportunity in front of him. Why doesn't he tell him of the faithfulness of God to him in the midst of all those sorrows? Why doesn't he, why doesn't he say anything about that? Has he momentarily forgotten how the Lord promised to be with him more than on one occasion? The Lord promised to bless him? How the Lord promised to protect him from Laban? Did he forget about that? How, he, how the Lord brought about a reconciliation between him and his brother Esau when Esau threatened to kill him and he was afraid all that time. Remember that? Genesis 32, 33. Did he forget about how God protected him after he, his two sons had slaughtered all those males in Shechem? Did he forget about how God had been meeting their needs during the famine? But there's none of that in this conversation. It just seems strange to me that he would answer Pharaoh in this way. But the, the funny thing about it is in chapter 48, <laughs> if you'll go a chapter further, chapter 48, he's going to testify that God has been my shepherd all of my life. He's redeemed me from all evil. He's going to say that. But why does he say it here when he's presented with this golden opportunity to talk to the Pharaoh of Egypt? This is your one shot to witness to Pharaoh. You kind of, in some ways, blew it. You, you, you did good on one hand. You didn't do so great on the other hand. You know who Jacob sounds like? He sounds like me at times in my life. And he may sound like you at times in your life. Yes, we know Christ. We know him. But our words may sound like we don't. If we're not controlled by the Spirit, we're liable to present a less than stellar witness to the world. A far less than stellar witness. We need to be careful of the testimony we present to a world without Christ. That's why we've got to be careful what we say how we live in front of lost people. There's nothing worse, by the way, than when people are leaving. A, a Christian family, you know, the Christian family in the neighborhood is leaving for church. They go out in the car in the driveway, and what are they doing? They're mad at each other, yelling. Uh, <laughs> hopefully no more than that. There's nothing worse than that kind of testimony. This is the Christian family in the neighborhood? You know, we need to be careful of what we say and do, because what, we're representatives of the one who saved us. We're representatives of the one who put a new song in our heart. This doesn't sound like a new song right here from Jacob. A, a new zeal to offer him praise. A new uh, outlook, a new conduct to reflect the glory of God. Right, let me ask this question. Is that happening with you? Or, is that happening, or are we more inclined to throw a pity party, even in the presence of unbelievers? We don't want to be that way. You know, I thought of the counterpart in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. Like, you know, like Jacob, he, was, he had the opportunity to testify before a king. Did you know that? Paul had, to testify, had the opportunity to testify before a king, King Agrippa, in Acts 26. Do you know what he says there? He's in a court trial. He gets arrested. He's not in great circumstances. He's in bad circumstances. Jacob would say, what? All these things are against me, right? Paul's in this court trial, and, he, and he te what does he do? He testifies of his salvation. He says, the Lord transformed me from a persecutor of Christians to a proclaimer of the gospel. He says in that chapter, Acts 26, I'm standing trial for the promise of God made to the fathers. He's talking about the Messiah. Paul was in, on trial here, arrested and on trial, yet he turns it into a platform for preaching Christ. All this before King Agrippa, before a king. He saw the golden, Paul saw that golden opportunity and he seized upon it and he made it count. Jacob didn't have that same lengthy opportunity that Paul had but what opportunity he did have could have resulted in a stronger testimony for the Lord than what we see here. I don't want to be nitpicking, but 
Let's face it, this could have been better. That's negatives about this conversation. There's positives also. This is where it gets better, by the way. While Jacob's tendency is to view life from a negative perspective, uh, nevertheless, he realizes that the life of a, of a believer is a pilgrimage. The life of a believer, he sees it, is a pilgrimage. Look at verse 9. He says, the years of my sojourning, he didn't say I've lived for 130 years. He says, the years of my sojourning are 130 nor have they attained to the years that my fathers lived during the days of their sojourning. Twice, he says that word sojourn. What does that mean? Sojourning is a, is a temporary stay. It's a, it's a person who resides as a place as a stranger. It's not a permanent dwelling. The sojourn in the Bible has a, has a place of his own, a country of his own, but then he leaves that country. He's displaced for some reason, like maybe because of a famine or a war or some other reason. And he packs up and leaves and goes to another country to live there for a while. Look back at verse 4. Jacob, Jacob's sons tell Pharaoh, we have come to do what? We have come to sojourn in the land. They didn't know, they were, well, we're going to be here for more than 400 years, but they say we've come to sojourn in the land. For the famine, why? The famine is severe in Canaan. They were displaced because of the famine. They had to get out. Jacob, Joseph told them to get out. And, and Jacob takes it a step further than that. He says, in his mind, the idea of sojourning has to do with life itself. On planet Earth, the entire length of a person's life, Joseph's whole life, Jacob's whole life, rather, is a place, is, is, a, is a sojourn, as were the lives of his grandfather and father. These guys all saw themselves as pilgrims on the earth. And then you think of the author of Hebrews who says the same thing in Hebrews chapter 11. He talks about the patriarchs like Abraham, and he says in Hebrews eleven thirteen, 13, I think it is, he says, those guys... They confessed they were strangers and exiles on the earth. We're not talking about just another country. They're strangers and exiles were on the earth. Or we could, say, <clears throat> we could say it this way. They were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Their state was only temporary. It lasted as long as their lives did because our lives are temporary. They look forward to a better and eternal residence in heaven. That's how all, of us should, all believers should view life. We should look at life as a journey Believers are on their way to the heavenly city. Even now, our citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3. Heaven is our permanent, eternal residence. That's how we should view it. And Jacob did view it that way. And as a result, our, if we look at life that way, our time and our money and our conduct and our work, all we do, <clears throat> we're going to see it from an eternal perspective. We don't live for time alone, but for eternity. <coughs> I love the old poem, Only One Life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. How are you spending your pilgrimage? Do you see this as a pilgrimage or do you view life in a different way? Are you investing for time alone, just for the here and now, just for the next day, or for eternity? It's a great difference. That's one positive. There's, a, there's another positive. Look at the blessing here. Pharaoh, Jacob blesses Pharaoh twice, verse 7, when he meets him. Uh, jo Joseph brings his father in and presents him to Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And then when he leaves his presence, verse 10, Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. Twice. What's exact, what exactly is involved, involved in this blessing? Well, it's hard to know. It just says blessing. <laughs> Some people think this is a, uh, a simple greeting. It's probably more than that. I think the, the word bless carries more force than that. Calvin, for example, says this is not a common greeting, but he says, and, and I quote, but this is the pious and holy prayer of a servant of God. Jacob may have even prayed for Pharaoh, and he's not the only one that says that. Others think the same thing. It's hard to really know, but I think the blessing was also a way for Jacob to show his gratitude for allowing them to stay in Egypt. <clears throat> but whatever was said in this blessing, I, I think it follows in line with Genesis 12.3. He's blessing Pharaoh. Genesis 12, 3, the Lord said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. How many times have we gone back to that verse? Patriarchs always go back to that verse because this, their blessing others comes from this idea. Now, Jacob's blessing, no doubt, in some way, I'm sure, pointed Pharaoh to God just as his son Joseph had done. Joseph had been a great witness to Pharaoh in many ways. And I think the word blessed leads us to think that way. But the point I want to make, though, is, is this. Even though Jacob's response is not all that it should be, in my opinion, he's still a channel of blessing to Pharaoh. He still is. 
And believers should make it a business, their business to be a blessing to those without Christ. Have you ever thought of it that way? We think of ourselves as witnesses. We should. Uh, we're here to witness to the loss. These people are going to go to hell if we don't tell them that. Yes, true. However, have you ever thought of yourself as a, to be a blessing to those without Christ? Think about it. We bless people when we point them to Christ. We're giving them the greatest blessing they could ever hear. We bless people when we show them by our words and actions that followers of Christ, though far from perfect, nevertheless, we glory in our Savior even in spite of difficulties, even in spite of difficult circumstances. That's a testimony right there. We bless people when we share with them a, gra- a heart of gratitude, put away a complaining spirit. God is good, uh, not only in, in, in granting us an eternal residence, but in allowing us to be a blessing to others as well. And finally, God is good in his provision for the family. He's good in his provision for the family, verse 11. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt. In the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, Ramses is a later name for Goshen, as Pharaoh had ordered, Joseph provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to their little ones. So Joseph not only settled uh, in, the, in his family in Goshen, he also gave them a possession in the land. Do you know what that means? A possession. The word possession is a land holding. That's a permanent inheritance in Egypt. The word possession refers to an inalienable property uh, received from a sovereign. You can't renege on that promise. Now, think about this. The Hebrews own land in Egypt. <laughs> they, don't, they, they have no possession in Canaan as yet, but they have a possession in Egypt, of all things, which shows that God's promise to make them a great nation in Egypt is coming to pass. They have possession in the land of Egypt. It's their land. They own it. According to verse 12, Joseph is fulfilling his promise to provide for the family. Uh, that's no easy task because that's about 70 people to care for. It's a lot. But notice, look at verse 12. The gracious Joseph is taking care of his father who missed him so much. Look at the next phrase. He's taking care of his brothers who mistreated him so much. Again, this love of Joseph, this forgiveness of Joseph, who was totally mistreated. Now he's providing for his brothers who mistreated him. And the whole household, it says. Look at the last phrase in verse 12. According to their little ones. That is an interesting phrase that literally reads this way. By the mouth of the little little ones. The mouth of the little ones. Remember, Jacob has 53 grandchildren. 53. (laughs) It's a lot of mouths to feed. And yet, in this verse, it tells us that everyone in the family will get to eat. All the way down to the smallest child. They'll not go hungry. They'll get to eat. Joseph is providing for them. What a beautiful picture of the provision of God for his people in the midst of a severe famine. Yet every child, no child left behind, in this case, they all get to eat. That tells me what? God is good. He provides for his own. Even in the most difficult of circumstances, he's able to do it. Whether in Jacob's case here in the famine or in, you think of the wilderness uh, when, they, when God fed them with manna, you think of the New Testament When God fed the 5,000 and the 4,000, God can do this. Now, do you know what I think happened after this incredible display of God's goodness to the people? I think they sang a song. That doesn't say this. But I couldn't help but think about this song. (laughs) Here are the words of this song. I'm not going to sing it, by the way. Ain't God good to give us so many blessings? Undeserving, that's what we are. And I kept singing it in my mind. Have you heard this song? Nobody's heard that song but me here. <laughs> I've, this is a special revelation I received, this song. <laughs> really, not really. <laughs> Ain't God good to give us so many blessings? Undeserving, that's what we are. I thought about that. I can't verify it. I'm almost certain that's what they sing. God is good. I've been thinking about this all last night and all today, thinking, studying this. God is good to we as people. He's done so much for us. I mean, we take this for granted. We take everything for granted. Think of it tonight, though. He's done so much for us in the way of spiritual blessings, in the way of material blessings. God is good to us. Let me leave you with this thought. Count your blessings tonight. Name them what? One by one. one. And it might just surprise you what the Lord has done. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful again, Lord. So many things to be thankful for. Uh, Lord, you've blessed us so many ways. We could 
we can count the ways, we should count the ways one by one because it shows that every little thing that happens in our life, such a great blessing, Lord, from the food you give us to eat today and every day to the uh, houses and the uh, places you allow us to live in and the cars we drive and the uh, jobs that we have and the <clears throat> all these material blessings, all the spiritual blessings we have in Christ of salvation and the scriptures and the Holy Spirit indwelling us and fel uh, Christian fellowship, and the list goes on and on. Lord, we can't thank you enough. Thank you for being good to us. Help us to recognize your goodness in our lives. Help us to, be, help us to reflect your goodness to others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.